Hi, uh, I'm going to read from uh, uh, Lincoln's Lie uh, and starting with the very beginning of the book. It was just after three o'clock in the dark early morning hours of May 18th, 1864, when the footsteps of a 17 year old boy broke the near silence around New York's printing house square. The newspaper editors had all closed up shop for the night having received the Associated Press's all-in alert, meaning that every bit of breaking news had been delivered to the paper's offices for the day, and therefore the morning editions could go to print. Editors Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune, James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald, and Henry Raymond of the New York Times, the three most powerful people in the press business, had already headed home or to social events. Lower ranking editors had departed thereafter, only the foremen and night managers stayed on, monitoring the churning high-powered steam-driven presses as they rolled over the newsprint paper, pa preparing the news to send far and wide. In his hands as he ran through the dark, the harried boy held fluttering copies of the Associated Press report. He ran from building to building along the edge of City Hall Park, visiting each of the city's biggest papers, pounding on doors. At the New York Times, he discovered an open door and hurried into the business office. He threw three pages down on the desk and rushed out. Then he ran to the Daily News and the New York Herald. At each paper, he barely passed to deposit the manifold pages delivered without an envelope and in full view of anyone picking them up. Having visited the Associated Press member newspapers near Park Row, the boy raced all the way down the cobblestone streets to the Journal of Commerce at the end of Wall Street near the banks of the East River. He knocked at the newspaper office door. No one answered. A copy holder who had just been fired for incompetence as the proofreader's second set of eyes sulked nearby out of view, but he heard the commotion and called out. The boy hurried over and thrust the tissue thin manifold sheets into the copy holder's hand. Only a crucially important story would be delivered at this strange hour. Glancing at the familiar format and handwriting of the Associated Press's small team of copyists, the copy holder struggled to read the text in the dark, but really realized the piece was long, he carried it inside. It had been 37 months of carnage since the American Civil War began. A couple of weeks earlier, Union General Ulysses S. Grant initiated his Overland Campaign with the aim of destroying Confederate General Robert E. Lee's army between the Rapidan River in North Central Virginia and the capital of the Confederacy in Richmond. At the start of the month, the most gruesome firefight of them all, the Battle of the Wilderness, had left the Union forces battling nearly blind for two days in the dense dark thickets of Northern Virginia. Soldiers could only detect the enemy approach by ear only determine the battle line from smoke rising above the trees, the flash of gunfire illuminating the bramble. Quote, there is something horrible yet fascinating in the mystery shrouding the strangest of battles ever fought, an eyewitness reported. The final casualty tally in eight days, 29,800. After the Battle of the Wilderness, the Union Army had moved south towards Spotsylvania, clearer ground. Over two days, Union forces inflicted high losses on the Confederates, including about 10,000 killed, wounded, or captured. Union losses were high as well. Assistant Secretary of War Charles A. Dana, formerly a journalist for the New York Tribune, remembered surveying the wreckage with night coming on. Quote, the silence was intense. Nothing broke it but distant, an occasional firing or the low groans of the wounded. I remembered that as, as I stood there, I was almost startled to hear a bird twittering in a tree. All around us, the underbrush and trees, which were just beginning to be green, had been riddled and burnt. The ground was thick with dead and wounded men, among whom the relief corps was at work. The earth, which was soft from the heavy rains, had been trampled by the fighting of the thousands of men until it was soft like thin, hasty pudding. Over the fence against which we leaned lay a gray pool of this mud, its surface as smooth as that of a pond. As we stood there looking silently down at it, of a sudden, the leg of a man was lifted up from the pool and the mud dripped off his boot. It was so unexpected, so horrible, that for a moment we were stunned. 
Then we pulled ourselves together and called to some soldiers nearby to rescue the owner of the leg. The armies moved into new positions starting on May 13th, but torrential rains starting on the 15th had stopped the fighting for three days. In that pause, Grant looked over the tally of 33,000 men killed, injured, or missing from the Union side. He expressed regret to Major General George G. Meade, head of the Army of the Potomac, who stood with him. Meade remarked, well, General, we can't do these little tricks without losses. Newspapers in New York braced for reports of these clashes. Under the printing room's oil lamp, the copyholder skimmed the lines of the Associated Press piece the delivery boy had just brought in. It was, nine paragraph, it was a nine paragraph proclamation from President Abraham Lincoln, countersigned by Secretary of State William H. Seward. Just a week earlier, on May 10th, the president had pushed an optimistic call to thanksgiving to the newspapers, asking everyone to thank God for the victories, bloody as they were, leading up to the Battle of the Wilderness. But now, in passionate, foreboding prose, Lincoln said the nation needed to, quote, meekly implore forgiveness, unquote. He reported that the recent battles at Spotsylvania had gone worse than expected, quote, in view of the situation in Virginia, the disaster at Red River, the delay at Charleston, and the general state of the country, unquote, Lincoln confessed he possessed a heavy heart and required a solemn day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. The previous year, he had also called for prayer and humiliation at the urging of Congress. That proclamation, too, had been countersigned by the Secretary of State. Lincoln then begged the people to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow. In this new proclamation, Lincoln tied his plea more closely to the recent events. While expressing faith in Grant and the damage he had caused the rebel forces, Lincoln lamented the nation's role as, quote, the monumental sufferer of the 19th century, unquote. But most terrifyingly, a desperate President Lincoln called for 400,000 men, more Union men ages 18 to 45, to sign up for the army immediately and report to the front. If he did not get his full quota, the compulsory draft would commence after June 15th. Every New Yorker was sure to tremble at renewal of the draft, given that Lincoln's first draft, less than a year before, had turned New York streets into blood-soaked, charred avenues of terror. When the citizenry rebelled, Lincoln had been forced to temporarily suspend the conscription. In March, just two months earlier, Lincoln had put out a call for 500,000 men as young as 20 years old, then found his demand reduced dramatically when various states argued that their previous volunteers counted against the quotas. Now Lincoln would require even more bodies, including those of men as young as 18. The foreman faced a costly decision. His editors were gone. Only four men labored over the churning press. The Journal of Commerce offices lay so far from the other newspapers that the foreman dared not other newspapers made of this proclamation and returned before the paper needed to be printed. Was the story so important that the presses should grind to a halt? Should he remove a story to make space for the president's horrific call? His options were limited. He could decide to hold the report until the editors arrived mid-morning, but by doing so, the Journal of Commerce might miss the enormous and dire story of the State of the Union cause and end up humiliated. His newspaper prided itself on its immediacy. It had been one of the first newspapers in pre-telegraph years to buy a schooner to snag the news arriving from Europe before the competition's rowboats could, could reach the ships, finishing their transatlantic journeys. The foreman also risked the ire of his boss, William C. Prime, if the Journal of Commerce lagged behind all the other papers. On the other hand, many editors insisted that absolutely nothing should be accepted in the columns without one of the editors present. In the end, the foreman decided the paper could not afford to be scooped. He quickly put his assistants to work. He ripped the proclamation into strips, each of the men taking a section to set into type. They hurried so quickly that no one stopped to read the final version in its entirety before the ink slipped the letters and the paper rolled through the muscle of the press. By morning, the daily edition would hit New York streets and the newsboys would screen the headlines about the need for hundreds of thousands of more bodies. Other copies would be sped by trains to cities across the United States and journey further still by boat to the trading floors of Europe. 
International bankers would then read the level of desperation of this news, helping them decide if the United States should be, once and for all, considered two nations. Uh, I then just wanted to read a little section uh, which gives you a sense of uh, interactions with, uh, with this one journalist interactions with uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. And uh, when Abraham Lincoln's going to his inaugural and he's taking a 13 day train ride to get there uh, and you'll find out why. Uh, the risks of this elongated journey to DC quickly became evident. However, as the train left Cincinnati, Lincoln's aides discovered a bag in his car with a ticking time bomb inside set to detonate 15 minutes from departure. They quickly diffused it, but the terror remained. With tensions high, the days flowed by in a ritual of whistle stops and starts, speeches and songs. Lincoln drew ever closer to the moment he would breach the slave state line. As Howard observed, even among friendly folk up north, the pauses in the small towns could become crazy. <laughs> Take, for example, the train's entrance during the first days into tiny the excited citizenry to get near their hero and devour the lunch that had been laid out on the long tables for the official retinue. Lincoln responded to the disappointment of his empty belly with his favorite recourse, falling asleep. The presidential car remained open to the press and so Howard found himself, that's the journals, found himself able to note for his readers that Lincoln did not engage in such unattractive activities as snoring, drooling, or snoozing open mouth, which Howard deemed a real positive in a president given Lincoln's inability to escape the scrutiny of the press and public. Lincoln's stupor also allowed Howard to more directly observe Mary Todd and inventory the admirable qualities that had earned her the president-elect's heart more than 20 years earlier. Replacing James Buchanan's beautiful orphan niece, Harriet Lane, as first lady would be no easy task for Mary Todd. The young Lane had become the darling of journalists for her charm. As one journalist would describe her at her final party at the White House while dressed in pure white, Lane was, quote, blonde with deep violet eyes, golden hair, classic features, and bright expression, and a mouth of peculiar beauty. Her form had a statuesque majesty and every moment was grace, unquote. Mary Todd, well-educated, older, and raised in a political family was less beloved for being more outspoken. Passionate about her husband and his values, she did not shy from voicing her political opinions or from fighting on his behalf, winning her few admirers. She drew fire from the press for her extravagant shopping sprees, including one to New York just before the train journey but Howard declared the accusations against her in many press accounts false. She, quote, does not chew snuff, does not dress in outre style, does not use profane language, nor does she, on any occasion, public or private, kick up shindies, unquote. According to Howard, her new admirer, she had luxurious hair, a large head with broad forehead, and clear blue intelligent eyes. He admitted, quote, her nose is, well, not to put too fine a point on it, is not Grecian, unquote. He insisted on reporting so meticulously, he even approved of her hands and feet, quote, which are really beautiful, unquote, as well as the shape of her ear. More importantly, he liked the fact that she had fallen in love with Abraham Lincoln when he seemed to hold no great future. And then, um, the final section that I wanted to read was just to sort of indicate those moments when as a nonfiction writer, you come across great back, background material uh, that allows you to tell a, a scene in sort of vivid prose. Uh, this is after the uh, Lincoln has put in an order to arrest the newspaper editors and the uh, put military in the newspaper offices in punishment for running this proclamation of his. Uh, and he's also arrested the telegraph operators. So this is um, the part where the telegraph operators are taken into custody. It was a deep dark night with thunder in the distance when the telegraph operators were marched to the battery and loaded onto the police boat, the burden. The other independent telegraph offices in the city also had been seized. 
Since it was past regular business hours, the soldiers found no one working in the gold room or in the telegraph offices just off the trading floor. The soldiers confiscated the independence messages and machines and they occupied, occupied the place from then onward. The independent operators still had no idea what their future held. One of the officers guarding them at Castle Garden thought they would simply stay on the burden for the night. But then the crew began to cast off the burden's lines to take the boat out to sea. The old Trinity church bell chimed 11 o'clock. As the boat steamed down the harbor, the lights of Governor's Island and Castle Williams vanished behind them. They were headed far beyond the city's embrace. Over the course of the hour and a half journey, the thunder intensified. A stiff wind curled white crested waves over the deck, leaving trails of foam. A vivid flash of lightning lit up the sky and revealed the grim walls of Fort Lafayette, the last stop before the New York Harbor opened to the vast Atlantic. The burden bumped up against the fort's dock. Rain came in torrents as the crew fastened the boat to the wharf of the massive prison. The telegraph operators, shaking themselves awake from their fitful dozing, grabbed hastily for their hats and were ordered to line up. The soldiers marched the operators toward the gloomy portals. In that deep night, the men were separated from their families and friends, their jobs and their city, and were jailed along with secessionists, pirates, blockade runners, and bounty jumpers. Whether guilty or innocent, as they well knew, people sent to Fort Lafayette remained there a very long time. The prisoners met Colonel Burke, a thick, balding 60-year-old man with, quote, altogether a war-worn and stern face, unquote. He favored an old coat and buffalo robe, smoked a pipe, and had at his heel his dog Carlo, who reminded people of Cerberus due to his ferocious appearance and his job at the gates of hell. Burke had come to this post after serving under General Scott during the Mexican War and earned his promotion due to his lack of hesitation in his assigned task for Scott, executing deserters. He asked the operators to sit and his assistant wrote their names in a ledger. Why had they been, been sent to Fort Lafayette, Burke asked. They replied they had no idea. Ah, yes, he said, no one ever knows what they come here for. This is a temple of innocence. He then escorted one of the operators into an adjacent room that housed a glorious downy white bed. The operator thrilled at the prospect of getting such a nice place to sleep so late in the night. Burke told him it was a mere formality. The operator assumed it meant the arrest and he would soon be freed from Fort Lafayette after a luxurious slumber. By it, however, Burke meant a thorough body search. All the operators endured the same. The jailers then escorted the prisoners to various barracks where they found 32 men to a room, their baggage stacked about their cells. Two of the operators slept in chairs with their heads on the transoms of cannons and one found a dining table in the mess to use as a bed. I'm Emily Hipshin. I'm here with Elizabeth Rush to talk with Elizabeth Mitchell about Lincoln's Lie, a true Civil War caper through fake news, Wall Street, and the White House. We're so delighted and excited by the opportunity to talk to you, Biz, and thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here with you. So um, all of us are very interested in how you came to this project, how um, it occurred to you that it was a project, where it all started um, and, and when you discovered you really did have something to write about. We're interested, the students are always interested in that too. Okay, well the um, last book that I published was uh, Liberty's Torch, uh, The Great Adventure to Build the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. This was based on me finding something interesting in the story of the statue's creation because I always assumed it was a gift of the French government to the US government. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it was one artist who tried to pitch a colossus uh, to Egypt originally. The deal fell through and so he uh, just came here knowing no one. I found his diary and that's from when he arrived here and so recognized how lonely and desperate he was. <laughs> so not interested in that story. But in any case, while working on that, I uh, there was a newspaper that was involved very much in the fundraising and it was bought at a um, you know very low price and it said the reason it was bought at this low price was because it had been shamed by running a fake proclamation of Abraham Lincoln's. And then it said, and Abraham Lincoln responded by arresting all the newspaper editors, 
putting the newspapers under uh, military, uh, you know, uh, command basically, and um, and also arresting all the telegraph operators. And I was so shocked by that version of Lincoln that I thought I would look into it more. And it was one of those stories, um, basically, if there's something like that, I put it to the side. And if it still has this kind of, you know, fluttering feel of, you know, there's more to it. A few months later, I start looking into it. And in this case, it just get, kept getting more and more interesting. I mean, it was for me too, a detective story of what really happened. Hmm. Liz, I want to say, first of all, just thank you. Um, I don't tend to read um, works that carry me back to the 19th century. I don't tend to read about Lincoln. And I found this such like a riveting account of a time that I often think of as pretty distant from our own. And I think your work does a really good job of, of helping us draw deep connections between the present day um, and the story that you tell. I'm interested um, so much about how this, the behind the scenes story of how you do this work as a nonfiction writer myself, you know, I work with stuff that's primarily contemporary. And so for instance, you know, your final, you did a reading today um, and you recount for us the scene where um, the different telegraph officers, op operators that you're talking about are getting carted off to prison and what that's like. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit um, about what archival documents you're pulling from to recreate that moment. And if, you know, I'm assuming that it's multiple and I'm assuming that, you know, you're having to sort of work in multiple registers to then come create a cohesive scene in the book. And I'd love to hear more about how you do that, what you're pulling from. Well, I think, first of all, I don't, I never set off to be a, someone writing about history. It just sort of came about because there would be, I, I sort of am more of a journalist and certainly from when I was at Brown, I was uh, interested in fiction writing um, and studied that more. Um, but the, uh, it's, it's when I come across something that just seems as if there's, that there is more story there that needs to be examined. I like to go into it that way. And I, don't ever choose a, a topic like I wouldn't just say I'm writing about Lincoln. You know, <laughs> that would never, never occur to me. It's that the narrative is interesting to me. So because these things are based on narrative, it allows you to um, look at people who would normally not be part of history. So, for example, in this the scene you're talking about with the telegraph operators, whereas that would be a footnote maybe in somebody else's book. Um, I, because I'm choosing to tell the story of what it felt like to be in this moment when this crisis is happening in the country, um, they get as much time as, you know, Lincoln's war secretary, you know, so, so, uh, so I just dove in trying to find out as much as I could about them. And it turns out that there's this amazing um, journal from back then uh, called Telegraph Age. And it was just written for and uh, for telegraph operators by telegraph operators. And so in uh, there were these instances where telegraph operators who first you got the contemporaneous, um, you know, report of what happened. But then you had these men who were, you know, had gone on, you know, decades past, like maybe you know, 15 years or something like that. And they decided to reminisce about what had happened. And so they tell their story and because it's personal to them, it's so vivid. And then you go back and you fact check basically everything they said to make sure that it matches up to, you know, like, yes, that building really was there. And yes, I found another source that says there were that many soldiers who came in and that kind of thing. Um, so that helps a great deal. And then the other thing is because we have so many more newspapers um, are uh, now digitally available because there are some incredible heroes really who are digitizing things that not even the Library of Congress has. You get to look up these people who at one point were real figures in history and get even more detail about who they were, their experiences and that sort of thing. So this is, it has a lot of ramifications too because there's histories that haven't been told that well, like women's history and, you know, history of, uh, you know, minorities in the country. And so that's what keeps me excited about what's possible. And I'm thinking about this, um, this question is of, of the people. Um, one of the things that I, I kept sort of juggling in my brain was the way in which the book 
um, integrates and crosses and bridges several different genres. Like it's clearly, there's a clear foundation in journalism um, and in archival journalism, but I kept, I kept um, thinking of it as biographical, like you were writing biography, particularly, I mean, of Lincoln. And we, it is in another place where we'll I wanna talk about where that's situated in, in Lincoln studies, which is this huge thing. Um, but <laughs> I know, right? Um, but, but also Mary Todd Lincoln, and um, isn't it Elizabeth Keckley? Her, her yeah. Um, yeah, her, her, um, her person really. Yeah, the and, mistress, yeah. Yeah. Basically like a tailor for, yeah. Yeah, but also somehow like a companion and a, I mean, there's, there's a richness to that relationship that of course you suspect is always there, but in any of that reading, but um, that you're getting at in ways that feel biographical too, like heavy and Howard too. And then there's this other stream, which is a kind of um, financial history about the gold standard, about gold speculation, about gold speculation during the war and then military history kind of layered on top of that. So I'm, I think about the generic packages into which this book might go. And I wanted to ask you how you sort of managed all those, I think of them as sort of spinning plates, like yeah. where you entered and exited generic conventions in order to create this, um, this, this real richness. Well, first of all, I felt very lucky because I've always wanted, I always wanted to, to write history or even not any nonfiction in a format that's slightly different than what I've seen offered. And, and sometimes people, you hand in a first draft and they say like, no, 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 <laughs> it has to be more this sort of rigid thing. I was very lucky to have Lee uh, Newman, who's, uh, who just as, you know, she won prizes recently at the Paris Review, et cetera, as my editor. And so she let me do what I wanted to do. And that was really great. Like, and she was so smart about her questions and things like that. So that helped a great deal. Um, but the uh, I could see that there was this story building up and, I, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, how the people were sort of moving through the narrative. I must admit long ago, I had a friend who um, who's a film director, and when I was working on a, actually the draft of a novel, I told him something, a scene in the beginning of the novel, and he said, "There's too much going on. You have to you have to thin that out, you know." And then he told me to read these, you know, two uh, screenwriting books, and I didn't really, you know, I thought coming from coming from my brown <laughs> creative writing department uh you know education and everything else i th thought that would be just you know turn into something quite you know i don't know too commercial or i don't know what i thought but in any case it ended up being an incredibly useful tool to the point that when i went to teach at columbia in narrative nonfiction, and the students were really struggling with how they could um, get there, get really like what it is, is like lodge the information in your reader's mm -hmm. mind and heart, you know? And so we started working with those structures and it was like, you know, after, you know, three sessions where it was a little bit of a struggle, all of a sudden everybody's work just lit up. So mm -hmm. I do work with that sort of thinking often. Um, and in this case, I had, had was structuring it almost, you know, after probably six months of research, I was getting the structure in place. So, uh, when I'm telling that story, I have to say that like you, there's certain things you're really looking forward to writing, like what you're talking about with Mary Todd and Elizabeth Keckley. That's a beautifully interesting relationship of a former slave who bought her freedom and then became the confidant of Mary Todd Lincoln. When I got to the gold story and I realized I was going to have to tell it, <laughs> I was just like, oh no, because it's so complicated and to boil it down into something that people can follow and read is really not the greatest fun in the world, but I'm glad I did it because it, first of all, it made me, it's so crucial to the story. And then also it's almost like the big bang of American uh, history and culture in as much as we see writ tiny, the things that still happen on Wall Street today, you know? So it was- I'm, I'm go finish what you were saying. And then no, I'll that's what I was just gonna say is like, I mean, some of these things you, you, um, you know, some of the, uh, some of the research and the writing and the explaining you go into joyfully based on the material and what, how you like to tell things. Sometimes you're just required to do it because it's your job, you know, to be, 
to be a teller, to be an explainer of, you know, what happened in history. Um, so as you're speaking, I feel like my brain is lighting up in <laughs> an additional register because I went into this conversation thinking, okay, here's this woman who wears a journalistic hat sometimes and has to play by a certain set of rules and conventions that journalism dictates. Mm -hmm. And here's a book of what I consider, you know, creative nonfiction. And there's a different set of rules that regulate what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And now as you're speaking, I'm realizing you've also got a background in fiction. Yeah. And, um, you know, the screenwriting probably is where you get the strength of writing dialogue. And that's something that really brings readers in. And I, I'm wondering if you can talk about how you navigate the dance of responding to the rules of each of these conventions. How, you know, do you, do you have to set aside your journalism hat to write this creative nonfiction? There are moments in this book where you suppose that this is what someone felt or you suppose that this is what someone was wearing. Um, you say they might have thought this. And that to me feels like something that would be absolutely for verboten in journalism. And I'm curious what it feels like to sort of move between those registers and how you and how you do that. Well, first of all, it, it, pretty much everything, I mean, everything in this book, uh, except I'll give the one little category that's not, if you said to me, where'd you get that? I could tell you where I got it. Like, there's nothing, I don't ever allow myself to say, you know, he watched the sunrise and I don't have any indication he watched the sunrise. I have to have a letter where he says, I watched the sunrise, you know, and then, and that's the documentation. So, um, can I pause, can I pause and ask a really nitpicky question before we like yeah. get even further into this answer? You describe the boat going out to the prison and you say like a lightning bolt cracks the sky. Yes. You have that? Yes, that's okay. the thing. That's what, and so that's why I wanted to read that section because it's about the fact that they're, what's so exciting right now is we have access to so many people's voices that we didn't have before because before you might have one copy of a memoir that was in Germany or something and you'd never see it. You know, you only had what was in the, available at the New York Public Library and everything on the East Coast, let's say, and if you got lucky enough, went to California or something. But the, the um, now we have access to these things. So you see the intimate views of what these people were feeling and thinking and what they experienced. So I, when I came across, you know, not only the lightning bolt, but the, you know, water coming over the, you know, the deck of the ship, I was like, this is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's one of those things you're just like, this is so exciting. Now that is not to say that I didn't have, you know, read 5,000 accounts of the rest that were boring and didn't, you know, but this is the person who it happened to. So that is to me a totally valid version of what, what, you know, transpired. So, I mean, a lot of it is a ton of digging. Like you're, you just, you have the sense that there's going to be a part of, you know, some scene that's going to have some vibration of interest and you know you'll be able to get your reader to understand what it was like to be in history <laughs> as the thing unfolded and so you keep searching and searching and so yes that's the one of those moments where you're you're just glad to come across that the only time that I ever do anything that's off the off the detailed history um, is if I need the reader to t take a moment and consider the mysteries of like what it felt like to be in there so it's like you know if it's um and it's always indicated it's not like i put it in the person's head and you know it'd be like you know was it you know because for example there's a moment where it's like was it a spy who planted the fake story was it a you know a detractor of lincoln's those were all theories that were in circulation at the time but it's asking the reader to just hone in on those all at the same time but it sounds like, <laughs> like you're actually most of the time wearing your journalist hat conventions. Yeah. Yes. But utilizing some of the craft techniques that you've picked up in your education around creative writing yeah. to sort of make those more spicy. The reason, I mean, I'm overall, I'm probably more of a reader of fiction, for example. I love fiction and I love writers and words and how everything 
you know, just the poetry of words and all that. But, um, but I'm pretty well trained now as a journalist. And I also really like the idea of uncovering the truth, like getting it or, you know, what closer to what the truth is. So, uh, so yeah, a lot of it is that investigative uh, tendency. But on the other hand, even this book, the reason why I wanted to write it too, is I thought, oh my God, that would be so fun. Like <laughs> you would get to see Wall Street right then. You would get to, you could, you would, move into those different circles of what it was like in that particular moment of time. And the other thing is I've always thought of it as sort of a stodgy time, you know, like uh, we, we have this idea of these people who, you know, that don't even resemble us or our friends or anything. And I, and when I started doing more of the research, I realized the language, the jokes, the, 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 the sort of flexibility of personality was much different than I expected. And so, that made it appealing to to dive into the that material too. I mean, so many great writers. Like, um, for example, that first passage I read. There's that long quote from Charles A. Dana, and it's partly just to say, let's res like resurface this great writing. I mean, that's I I think pretty you know remarkable description of of the Civil War battlefield. So I, I actually have two two questions. One that sort of follows up on this. Do you find when you're writing that um, the the necessity of finding the lightning bolt, like you have to find in order to write the lightning bolt, the lightning bolt has to have existed. Uh -huh. Is that limiting? Oh, it's exhausting. Is what it is. <laughs> It's really exhausting. I'm sort of tempted to ask you how you keep track of all of that. Like, do you have a system for that? It's horrible. But it's just, I mean, at one point I even, I considered doing Scrivener, um, but <laughs> then I realized I needed to move faster than I could to even learn that system. So I have systems, you know, so it'll be, you know, I immediately start dividing up files that are for a particular chapter and loading in all the research of that. And then, um, and there's, yeah, it's tons of taking taking those chunks, going writing them out, seeing the gaps, rewriting, re researching. Um, it's definitely a nightmarish <laughs> experience at some point. But I find that like anything, you know, if you if you if you've ever you know like renovated, you know, personally done the painting and shellacking in your own home or whatever, anything like is a big project, and so um, and always has those moments of wishing you were in the middle of it but I mean the but then it it kind of pays off you know I mean it's it, it's exciting when you get it to 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 flow in the right way so that people are re-experiencing it I mean I would like it if people became more interested in history in in this sort of way of trying to reanimate it and um maybe step away from the idea that you have a conclude like that the event happened and we know what happened, but we don't really know what happened until we look at the actual sort of minute to minute dissection of it. I'm just hoping for the sake of our students, like you briefly said, you have a file and you break it down and then you put it in different folders mm -hmm. as you write the chapter. What does that look like? Like, can you slow that down? Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I think that question of keeping track of sources is certainly painful. I know that with my first book, there came a moment where I got fact-checked and it was a 98 page document they produced. And I had moments where I was like, shoot, I don't know exactly where I got the information that 250 million years ago, sea levels were this high. So. Horrible. Um, could you slow that down and yeah. unpack that a little bit? Like, what is it to really keep track of? This well, thing? yeah, for, uh, first of all, yeah, I don't, I think there's no, I decided on this book, this is my fourth book, um, and I've written many, many articles. I have decided there is no easy, pleasant way to go through it. You're just, at some point, it's going to get difficult. And I think one thing I have going for me is I do have, I think I may have a little bit of a, like, a, uh, for example, if someone asks me where something is, I can actually imagine where it was on the page. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that, that and maybe everyone has that, but it's it, but it's um, it makes it simpler. But of course, there are some times where you just come across something and you think, 
I don't know where that was. And all you can hope is that in the process of all the other fact checking you're doing, you're going to come back and find it. Otherwise it has to get cut. I mean, so, um, I mean, I do put um, footnotes on very early on. Um, uh, I in, actually, I think that's incredibly important. At my first book, I didn't do it that way. I had some other system and that was terrible. So <laughs> I think that's kind of key right from the beginning. Um, I also am very big at labeling everything like screenshots, um, you know, uh, links. Uh, I take, I go, when I go into the archives, you're taking pictures on your phone and I try to download those the very night I do it and immediately label them so they can be searched again. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, but it, it yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, all I get, the, the thing with the files is that I set up a structure fairly early on of what the book was going to look like, what was going to happen in each chapter. So for example, there is a gold chapter mm -hmm. um, with, and then everything that I was finding would go into that particular chapter. And then in the documents that are separate that go across many things, it would say Lincoln gold, you know, uh, May set May sixteenth or whatever it is, and then you know would be searched from there. And you'd put that in the file name. Yes. Yeah. 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 I don't know if that's <laughs> that's helpful. I think that's, no, that's super helpful. helpful. Yeah, it's really helpful actually, and the students will love that to hear about how you're you organize the material, but also how you organize the project in your own mind to yeah. get to um, the material in the way you have to in order to make it factual. And, and I suppose this is the place where I can ask productively, like, were you in Lincoln studies or, or Civil War studies, um, not archives, but the writing that's done about Lincoln? Because one of the things that I experienced in reading this was a kind of, um, wow, this is a re- I almost thought of it as a rebranding of Lincoln, like it, it because I've done a, a just a little bit of, yep. of of that work, and so I just thought, it had, where do you see? How did you feel going into Lincoln studies in this particular way? Well, uh, first of all, there I had it. At one point, after I'd been working on it for a little while, I had that thought of, oh no. <laughs> I mean, I'm reading their work, obviously, and I'm very much involved with it, but I also suddenly realized, oh no, they're also this sort of audience that's going to have things to say about this particular project. And I was lucky enough that when I finished it, I sent it to my biggest hero in the whole Lincoln research world, who I didn't know at all. And and luckily he loved it. And so I and had actually things to add about, you know, well, and here's another piece of good evidence that you could, you know, look into. So, um, so that was a happy, uh, you know, ending to that part, but, uh, I th why I thought it was worth doing because if you look at the number of books on Lincoln there it's I guess he's the most written about person other than Jesus I guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like close to that yeah. George Washington is in there somewhere too but so. I don't think he gets quite <laughs> I don't think he gets the press that Lincoln gets now but but I thought that because of the fact that so you know Lincoln obviously presided over such enormous uh issues and events, you know, so I mean, you start with slavery as, you know, the key thing that needs to be discussed. And then you go into the battles, you know, of the Civil War and what that meant. Um, and so he's never been looked at as just, or no, I should not say that he has been looked at, but I don't think that he's been, the things that look at him in a different lens um, are given an easy access for people just wanting to read about Lincoln, you know? So, I mean, much of the, you know, you know, much of the research that's, that I found astounding and used in the book, you know, comes from the work of, you know, certainly Michael Burlingame and Harold Holzer and uh, David Herbert Donald and all these people who have done such incredible research in the archives. And one of the most, um, useful things was thing it was material that Michael Burling actually got at Brown from the uh, the Hay Library. Hay Library, yeah. And Somebody so um, because he started looking at the staff members around uh, Lincoln and the actual correspondence um, and and the diary entries and all those sorts of things. 
And so that gives you a more intimate and a more nuanced view of Lincoln, I think, than we've had before. But I think the fact that the story is the narrative going through all those power centers allows you to look at him at you know, other parts of him than to just honor his legacy for you know what he how he saved us from the horrible scourge. <laughs> I mean, like the insanity that we were in before. So, um, so I think that's that's what's unique and why it allowed it allowed a new view on, of him. Yeah, it was it was great for that. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, I think part of part of what I see you know differently and what you're building on here, Emily, is that we. I feel like I'm encouraged to see Lincoln as a media manipulator. Mm -hmm. And that was um, certainly eye-opening for me. I had never attached that to the persona of Lincoln, that characteristic to the persona of Lincoln. And I think for me, that was one of the most interesting things that the book really achieves is to say, you know, in context with the present moment, we think of, I think of Donald Trump as being, you know, particularly savvy and frustratingly good at um, media manipulation. Mm -hmm. Although I have to say, one of my favorite moments of the past couple of days has just watched, been watching his Twitter feed and watching Twitter say, you know, we won't corroborate with you in this misleading of the nation anymore. You know, this, this tweet has questionable content. <laughs> For me, that was like, hallelujah, but you know, four years too late, however. Um, <laughs> my point being that, you know, I think I tend, to, my instinct is to think of that as exceptionally awful and, and I judge it, awful behavior. Um, and here we are forced to encounter someone who is really a hero in the American mind doing some of the very same thing. Yes. And I'm curious, you know, how then, how would I put this? Like, how did your understanding of what role sort of centers of power have in veering towards or away from veracity? Um, and then the way that they're interacting with the news media to manipulate that idea. Um, I assume that for you working on this book that your relationship to sort of a set of expectations around what is respectable behavior and what isn't um, shifts. And I'm curious if you can just talk about what that was like. Sure, I mean, I, I think that um, first of all, one thing that when I was working on it, what reassured me was that, you know, we're li we have been living through a period of time that everyone seems, we all, including myself at times have felt like, wow, we're the worst that has ever come along, you know? <laughs> and so it's sort of reassuring to, to look into this history and realize, no, that's not the case. We, there, we have always been kind of terrible and there have always been heroes who, who rise up. And there has always been this uh, necessity of monitoring each other in order to have this cohesive society. So, uh, you know, that comes down to, you know, calling Lincoln, you know, when he gets called to account on what he, his behavior around this fake proclamation, which turns into a constitutional crisis. It's, it's the governor of New York and then an attorney general in New York who actually have to call him to task, you know, by prosecuting his generals who went and made these arrests. Um, for what appeared to be, you know, uh, I mean, basically they they acted unconstitutionally. They 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 seized these private presses without any warrant or you know charge or evidence or anything like that. Um, the uh, the other thing is the manipulation. You know, it's distressing to me on a certain level to see the things that he did, particularly when he was running for election in 1860, that he bought secretly a newspaper that was going to be key to the demographic he needed to win an election. That's straight out distressing to me and then and would be horrifying to me if I learned of it now. But on but then you're you look at what he was doing, which is that he was essentially uh, invested in getting his issue taken care of, which was slavery. So then you get into issues. I, I decided like, I don't want to make any um, judgments for the reader. It's kind of up to the reader to make those judgments. But I mean, so what is most important? Is it 
is that the constitution or are there, or, or do we allow for situations where if it's like this, it's such a dark thing that you're trying to get rid of and whose judgment, you know, it's just like, it's, it, it adds complications. I will say that he never seemed to do anything that was straight out for ego purposes um, or to just, it was, it was more, you know, in service to the, to that goal. Um, but uh yeah, it, it, I, I think that it also is a little bit of a um, giving, laying out for people that they might need to watch for these sorts of things in the future. If someone did it back then, they could easily do the same thing now or in the future. And I also feel like for me, as a researcher and a writer, it also reminded me that I sometimes have a bit of a set of blinders on perhaps when I encounter historical documents. If I encounter a news article from 1863, there's a sense, my instinct is to understand that as some, like it, I don't know how to put it. It's almost like I understand that as a photograph. I also know that photographs lie and are easily manipulated, Mm -hmm. but there's, I want to understand it as like a replica of a recording of what happened. And the book really asks me, I think, to fundamentally revisit those assumptions. I know that they're not true in the present tense, but why, you know, why is it when I look backwards, um, some of these instincts come rearing back up. I find that really fascinating. Well, well, there's even, um, you know, the reporter who's at the center of this book, um, he, you know, despite all of the crazy things that happen in, you know, in the course of the narrative that's in the book, um, he manages to afterwards rise up and become perhaps the best paid journalist of his time, the most famous, etc. And there's something that I came across in the archive, but I was just like, we can't really add it in here because this will just get people too confused but he he writes law in his dotage about his um meeting with his his spending time with lincoln the night before lincoln goes to his inaugural and it's lincoln saying goodbye to his books and so it has this whole long thing how the two of them just spent the whole night with the saying goodbye to the books (laughs) and so but i have his first article about him and he says i saw lincoln for the first time and it's when he uh, Lincoln arrives on the train to his first city after leaving his home um, city. So there's no chance that that journalist, when he was young, would have skipped over that first meeting. So he just concocted it, you know. So it's, you know, there's a certain level you have to always be a little bit, you know, you have to want question most things you see. And I think actually readers from the past were a little bit more comfortable with that, that they knew that they had to look at multiple newspapers. They, you know, they they took things with a certain grain of salt while also welcoming the fact that reporters were bringing them news that they needed. Do you think that um, part of the character, I'm sorry, my the background noise. Um, do you think part of the character of Lincoln and especially the things that are happening with the media are special because of the war as a background that the war, somehow the civil war intersects the media and intersects Lincoln's character in a in a particularizing way that's sort of different than now. Well, I think that the the one of the most interesting echoes to me was where the telegraph was then equal to where we are with the internet. Um, because at the time that I'm writing about it, the uh, telegraph had been around for 30 years already. Um, but when Lincoln first took office, it was so uh, newish that he only sent maybe one or two uh, telegrams a day. Uh, and he would have to send an agent down into the city office to deliver it, stand in line like everyone else. It, the wires ended up getting moved into the war department, which was right near the White House. And then he just started living there and reading everything and monitoring everyone and sending out many, many messages. Um, and people talked about how nervous it made them to ha- that he had this direct communication and it was like lightning. But it was also, the telegraph was dividing the country and Samuel Morris who invented it um, had thought it was gonna bring everyone together but instead it had this terrible effect and he was oh. <laughs> like, he started a society to, of national unity trying to like re-knit us. So I think the thing that's interesting is that it's, it's, it's almost as if, you know, 
we're so close to what that was, the, this partisan fights, the, the technology being at this early, this early stage, but developed enough so that people had learned how to abuse it and, um, and had not yet gotten totally savvy to what was possible there. And then we worked our way out. So what you can hope is that actually we're in a sort of cycle where we're starting to get savvy. I mean, look at the difference between, you know, four years ago that we have, as you were saying, Twitter, uh, you know, blocking the president's false tweet. Um, you have Facebook clearly cracking down much more than they had before. I mean, still false stories came through during the election, but you know, not as much as it had been. So, um, and similarly with the Telegraph, people just started getting more savvy as they went along. So I think it's it's not, um, I, I, I see so many similarities um, and I, uh, my hope would be that our, our knowledge and experience will catch up to a point where we're broken out a little bit from that ease of manipulation. It's like, you know, it, we're like, three-year-olds on the track of life you know, <laughs> where we need to be like more like adults and that you know not just tricked by someone pulling a penny behind our from behind our ear is that would you say that that's um something that you hope your readers to take away from this book like as they as they close the final page mm -hmm. Um, if you've done this one thing, you've succeeded. Is this in the realm of what you're hoping to accomplish by, well, by, uh, by working all these genres and painting this really interesting picture of this moment? My, uh, I mean, I think uh, my hope was to sort of re-engage people with the past, first of all, and to start to really kind of comprehend I guess if like I'm, sure, I'm just thinking out loud as from what you're saying, but I think that that's overall the mission of my work. I think it, it, even if it's a nonfiction piece of you know about now, I just want to get people to like put themselves in the shoes of other people, right? So in this case, it's even to put themselves back into that um, point. But it was just that from my research, I felt so reassured. I just like I, I loved to actually find that you know people have that that like I said, that we weren't, we're not so uniquely bad that there have been all kinds of struggles along the way. And I think that the, you know, there is a sort of, there's a certain sense of probably from the book of like my ideas of, you know, what America is supposed to be, what it, where it fails, um, what it could still be. Um, and I just think that that, that, question is so interesting and we're in a moment where we're trying to reevaluate that and be be better and all those sorts of things so I just sort of hope there would be some resonance in that way yeah finding out that this is not really all that new yeah is, yeah and that they, there's a kind of cyclical as you were talking about a cyclical approach to technology that a new technology comes, we sort of suck at it and then we get better at it, right? And, and yeah. our, our sort of American um, affinity for shysterism is the best yeah. way I can think about it. Like we really like marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, that that can kind of gum up the works yep. periodically, yeah, but well, it's periodical. Yeah, I mean, you know, and we see this with every kind of development in our country, right? So, you know, factory lines and what we learned about how to keep people safe and those sorts of things. So it's just, um, it, I, the one thing that I guess during this whole period that I've always felt was the most dangerous is people just getting weary because they think we're, we're on this just complete, you know, downward dive where I think that that's not the case. I just, I always feel that that also this was from working on my Liberty's Torch book. I mean, the reason he made it a Colossus was because he saw the um, Sphinx and the pyramids and he thought only a big thing will last forever. And so the idea was that, and this is like a little bit sad too, <laughs> that the idea was that even if democracy failed here, there would be a marker that it once existed, you know, that it wouldn't get worn down. And so I always think that, you know, these ways in which we can engage in the past and make it to have an understanding of the fact that, you know, it's, these government systems that we work in, including our presidency, are such, you know, 
fragile, exotic, weird things, you know, that, that basically it kind of requires this constant effort and engagement. And so seeing people as people back then, you know, doing it as opposed to reading some fact, you know, like Lincoln went into the newspaper offices, but instead seeing what it was like for a telegraph agent to have his hands lifted off the keyboard, you know, with, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the coding machine um, with a sword mm -hmm. and what that felt like and not knowing how it was going to end up gets us a little bit closer to understanding how the challenges just will always sort of come and you just kind of have to play your, your role. Yeah, that's one of the, the interesting things when students or anybody wonders about the value of history. I, I tend to think they haven't really seen the hands lifted by the sword yeah. and, and identified in that embodied or empathic way. Yeah. But fiction can do, like fiction yeah. does that. And creative non, good creative nonfiction where it intersects, fiction can do that. But see, that's, and I think the reason why fiction though has always been able to do it and nonfiction sometimes doesn't is because of that slightly um, dead quality to some nonfiction that it's already done. Like, you know, um, uh, so, you know, yeah, like you don't have to worry about it. I mean, any we would feel that way about anything we thought was a finished, exp, you know, experiment, you know, you get the result, well, that's, then there's no other story to it. So I think that's why trying to get into it from this other perspective might be helpful. I mean, I even found helpful things like there was, um, there's a moment in it where I had the great advantage of having one of the newspaper editors who got arrested was separated from his wife who he loved dearly, who was up mm. in Hartford, Connecticut. So they end up having this communication between them, which is happening multiple times a day, which I mean, the chances of that back in that age is really, you know, it's very slim, but it allowed for you to get these even small nuances where, for example, she talks about the fact that she's a Democrat. She's gone up to visit her Republican family members. And she, she says that they, you know, were calling her traitor and going after her so she just got a headache and went up to bed <laughs> it, like, it sounds like everybody at thanks right about now yeah <laughs> well biz this has been so wonderful thank you so much for the conversation and um i learned you know yeah this has been great well it's been so fun to talk to you both i, I enjoyed the book so much oh thank you Thank yeah, you. Thank you for spending time with us. And thank you for carrying me back to a time period that I don't usually get the opportunity to travel. And I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was great to see you. <laughs> Good it's luck up in Providence. Thank you.